ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور وسوسات او سكيسوجنس ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا We seek Allah's protection from the evil of ourselves and our bad deeds. May yahdihi Allah fala mudillala wa may yudlil fala hadiyala. Whoever Allah guides, there is no one who can lead him astray. And whoever Allah wants to bear his power, no one can give him guidance. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduh wa rasuluh. And I bear witness that there is no God but the most of Muhammad and Allah alone is. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. And I bear witness. Brothers and sisters, we will be looking at a number of narratives from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in so doing, we will be looking also at the lives or something about the companions who narrate some of these narratives looking at the text of the hadith itself and some of the benefits to be derived from it. We will try to do this in a way that is brief so as to cover a number of narratives, inshallah, and try not to be overbearing and to make it as informal as if you were present here with me in discussing these narratives. The first of the that we'll be looking at is found in the Book of Aman collected by Imam Muslim it's on the authority of Abu Jamr he related I was an interpreter between Ibn Abbas and the people and a woman happened to come there and asked about Nabi a picture or container in which wine used to be prepared. He replied, a delegation of the people of Abdul Qais came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, asked the delegation or the people of the delegation to identify themselves. We asked him about their identity. They replied that they belonged to the tribe of Rabia. He, the Prophet wasallam, welcomed the people or the delegation which were neither humiliated nor put to shame. They said, O Messenger of Allah, we come to you from a far off distance and there lives between you and us a tribe of the unbelievers of Mudah. And therefore, it is not possible for us to come to you except in the sacred months. Thus, direct us, direct us to a clear command about which we should inform the people besides us, and by which we may enter Zon or paradise. He, the Prophet wasallam, replied, I command you to do four deeds and forbid you from doing four acts. And added, I direct you to affirm belief in Allah alone, to have Iman in Allah alone. And then he asked them, Do you know what Iman in Allah really implies? They said, Allah and His Messenger know best. The Prophet wasallam said, it implies that you testify to the fact that there is no God worthy of worship other than Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, that you establish prayer, that you pay the zakah, that you fast in Ramadan, and that you pay one-fifth of the spoils of war. And I forbid you to use God, wine jars, and other receptacles that were prepared for wine. This narration has a number of benefits. 
among the benefits that we have is Ibn Abbas, who is considered a, an ocean of learning. Abdullah Ibn Al Abbas, who was born three years before the Prophet immigrated from Mecca to Medina. He was blessed by the supplication of the Prophet ﷺ who prayed, O oh Allah, give him understanding of the deen and the ability to interpret the Qur'an. He died, Ibn Abbas, after becoming a great scholar in Islam, at Ta'if, 68 years after the Hijrah, during the days of Ibn Az Zubair, and after becoming blind, losing his sight. Also, we see in this hadith the importance of undertaking a journey for the acquisition of knowledge, and that this was something that the early companions did during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We also benefit from this narrative something of the personality of the Prophet Wasallam and teaching and how gentle he was with his companions and those who came in search of knowledge. Also, the definition of faith as given by the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam himself and that faith is not only a matter of the heart but it is also a matter of implementation and putting into practice those important aspects of our faith. For example, what was pointed out in this hadith, salah, the zikah, and also the consequences of jihad, the spoils of war that it receives after engaging those who disbelieve and would prevent people from entering into Islam. And also, the belief or having a recognition and understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of these things help us to understand that the concept of Iman in Islam is very active and it is not sufficient for an individual just to simply believe and that is it. But there is more to it than that. The following narration is on the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar. He relates that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I have been commanded to fight against people until they testify that there is no God worthy of worship other than Allah and that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah and they establish prayer and pay zakah and if they do it, and their property are guaranteed protection on my behalf except when justified by Islam and their affairs rest with Allah. This narration was reported on the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar. He is the son of Umar ibn Khattab, the second Khalifa after the Prophet wasallam. Abdullah embraced Islam at a very young age in Mecca and his first participation in the battles was at Khanda. He lived for a very long time and was a container of knowledge. He died at Mecca the year 73 and there he was buried in the graveyard of the Muhajireen. Among the other benefits to be held in this hadith is the importance of salah and zakah along with iman in Allah and the Prophet وسلم, as the final messenger from Allah. This is brought out by the fact that the Prophet وسلم, said that he was commanded to fight with the people until they declare or bear witness 
that there is no God worthy of worship other than Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Among the benefits <coughs> is that a person is to be judged according to what he shows, whatever appears of his deeds of good. And when a secret is left to Allah. Also, <coughs> among the benefits that the ulama derive from this hadith is that it is compulsory to fight against those who refuse to pay zakah or salah or any other compulsory act in Islam as Abu Bakr did with those who prevented the zakah during his time. These are a few of the benefits from this particular hadith. Hadith number three. It is now over on the authority of Maqdad ibn Aswad that he said to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam What do you think? If I encountered a person amongst the infidels, the disbelievers and he attacked me and struck me and cut off my hand with his sword then in order to protect himself from me took shelter under a tree and said I become a Muslim for Allah's sake Messenger of Allah can I kill him after he uttered this? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said do not kill him I said Messenger of Allah he cut off my hand and uttered this after amputating it should I then kill him? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Don't kill him. For if you kill him, surely he will be in a position where you had been before killing him. And verily, you will be in a position where he had been before he uttered the Shahada or the Kalima, the words of Iman. As for the person narrating this hadith, Al-Muqdad radiallahu anhu, he was one of the first to embrace Islam. According to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he said from among the first individuals to declare Islam in Mecca, there were seven, but amongst them was Muqdad. Muqdad also was amongst those who immigrated to Habasha. His kunya is Abu Aswad. Among the benefits of this hadith is that a person who declares Islam, his shahada or his declaration should be taken at face value. He is to be accepted as a Muslim once he utters the shahada. And he begins to pray and do the things that a Muslim does. Thirdly, what we have in this narration where the Prophet ﷺ said to the Sahabi concerning the taking the life of this individual, he says, hey, Don't kill him, for if you kill him, verily he will be in a position where you had been before killing him. This means that he, as your blood is sacred before killing him, and there is no reason whatsoever for you to be held accountable for anything, he would be in that position. And if you take his life after he utters the shahada, then you would be the way he was before he uttered the shahada. That is, you would be held accountable and likely to be punished. The only reason that he was not punished was because of the state of war and the fact that there were circumstances that prevented him from being held accountable. Under normal circumstances, he would have been punished for taking the life of a person who had uttered the shahada. Hadith number four. 
It is my reading on the authority of Shabi that one among the citizens of Khorasan asked him, Oh, Abba Amr, some of the people amongst us who belong to Khorasan say that a person who freed his bondswoman and then married her is like one who rode his sacrificial animal. Shabi said, Abu Burga, the son of Abu Musa, narrated it to me on the authority of his father that verily the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is said. There are three classes of persons who would be given a double reward. One who is amongst the people of the book, who believed in his apostle and lived to see the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and affirmed his faith in him, and followed him, and attested to his truth. For him is the double reward. And the slave of the master who discharges all those obligations that he owes to Allah, and discharges his duties that he owes to his master, for him there is a double reward. And a man who had a bond woman, and fed her, and fed her well, then taught her good manners, and did that well, and later granted her freedom, and married her. For him is the double reward as well. Then Shabba said, Accept this hadith without giving anything. Formerly a man would travel to Madonna, even for a smaller hadith than this. This narration was on the authority of Abu Musa. His name is Abdullah ibn Qais. He is very well known by his kunya, Abu Musa and Ashari. He is one of those who embraced Islam at an early time. He came to Medina after the opening of Khaybar and his ship along with that of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib met and they all came together to Medina. The Prophet وسلم, used him as a person to go and teach the people in Yemen and maybe he was used by the Khulafa as a teacher in the different Islamic provinces. Among the benefits to be derived from this hadith, so it is pointed out by the Prophet wasallam, that is the individual who believed in the scriptures sent down to the prophets before, and specifically to Isa and Musa wasallam, before it has been abrogated, that these people if they believe and follow the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, submit to his teachings, they shall have two rewards. Rewards for the first belief and the practices then, and also for believing later in the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and following him. This particular hadith also points out the responsibilities that an individual has to others in the society as well as to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is pointed out in the servant who fulfills or discharges his duty to the one who owns him and also is mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and carrying out what is due to him. If he discharges both responsibilities, he shall find with Allah to rewards. This narration also points out the importance of a person who has someone under his care taking care of them. More specifically, a person who has a maid servant. He has a slave girl and he teaches her and he treats her well. He feeds her and he feeds her well and then frees her. This person 
if he does this and rather marries her, he has two rewards, as pointed out in this narration. The narration also, in the end, as pointed out by Shabi, speaks about the attitude of the early scholars in taking long journeys in search of knowledge. And he said that take this knowledge, pointing out that it is not with a lot of effort that you're doing so, and pointing out at the same time that before time, there were people who had to journey long distances for even shorter narratives. It has been an encouragement for those who hear it to remember it and put it into practice. Hadith number five. There is a lady on the authority of Annas that the Prophet said, There are three qualities for which anyone who is characterized by them will taste the sweetness or shall find the sweetness of faith. Firstly, he to whom Allah and his messenger are dearer than all else. Secondly, he who loves a man for Allah's sake alone. Thirdly, and he who has such a great abhorrence of returning to unbelief after Allah has rescued him. As he has for being cast into the fire. The narrator of this hadith, Anas ibn Malik, Abu Hamza, was from among the Ansar. He was one of those who served the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the time he came to Medina until he died. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina at a time when Anas was only ten years old. He lived for a very long time more than a hundred years. And he stayed in Basra during the Khilaf of Umar teaching the people. And according to what we have in the books of history, he was the last of the companions to die at Basra. This hadith, first of all, points out that Allah, obedience to him, should be above all things in the life of those who believe. And following the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, along with that, there should be nothing in the life of a believer dear to him than obedience to Allah and the love to follow Muhammad wasallam. If a person has this in his life, he will begin to taste the sweetness of faith. If Allah and his messenger Muhammad they're dearer to him than anything else. Also, the hadith points out a second benefit. And that we should love people for the sake of Allah. This here, means that a person should be upright if we are to befriend him and that the closer he is to Allah's deen, the closer we should want to be to him. Our love and hate them should be for Allah's pleasure. Thirdly, returning to the hellfire, returning to the state of disbelief is something that we should learn from. Which means then, that we should act obediently, that we should develop obedience, we should develop love through obedience. And do those things that would help us to hate what Allah hates. And if a person takes these three things, he has surely tasted the sweetness of faith. The thought of death, 
is on the authority of Abdullah ibn Amr. He relates that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said four things. Whoever has all of them is a pure hypocrite. And whoever has one of those characteristics, he has a characteristic of hypocrisy until he gives it up. When he speaks, he lies. If he holds a covenant, he proves treacherous. If he promises, he breaks his promise. And when he argues, he exceeds the limits. This narration was reported on the authority of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As ibn Wa'il al-Sahmi al-Qurashi. Abdullah was one of the early companions of the Prophet sallallahu He embraced Islam before his father did. That is, Amr ibn al-As. His father was only 13 years older than he was. Abdullah is considered one of the very learned individuals from among the Sahaba of the Prophet He died 63 years of the year of the Hijra. This narration has a number of benefits. It deals first of all with hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is of two types. Hypocrisy which deals with your deeds and hypocrisy which deals with your belief system. The first type of hypocrisy which is associated with a person's actions actually makes a person a disobedient servant of Allah and it does not take him outside of the fold of Islam. That is what they call nifaq amal or hypocrisy in respect to one's deeds. A person does the acts of a hypocrite. As for the other type of hypocrisy which is known as nifaq atiqad, this is that type of hypocrisy which takes an individual out of Islam to actually disbelieve in your heart, but pretend to be a Muslim. So, when this particular hadith is looked at, we have to understand it within this context. For this reason, we find that some of the ulama, when speaking about this, they, in an attempt to clarify it, say that what is meant by this hadith is a warning, and that an individual is considered sinful if he has these characteristics. He is considered sinful. And it is a warning to the Muslim, to the person who believes, not to develop these bad characteristics. Because it is fair that if he continues to do so, that it might lead him to actual hypocrisy. The type of hypocrisy which takes an individual out of Islam. Among the benefits is that this particular hadith refers to the individual who has these characteristics within his personality more often than not. As for a person who, for example, breaks his promise once, he is not considered as having <coughs> or can be labeled as a hypocrite. As for hadith number seven, this hadith is narrated on the authority of Tariq ibn Shihab that Marwan initiated the practice of delivering the khutbah before the salah on the Eid. A man stood up and said, the prayer precedes the khutbah. He, Marwan, remarked, this practice has been done away with. Upon this, Abu Sa'id remarked, This man has done his duty. I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, He who amongst you sees something wrong, he should change it with his hand. And if he is not able to do so, he should do so with his tongue. Change it with his tongue. And if he is not able to do so, he should at least hate it in his heart, and this is the weakest of faith. This narration 
deals with commanding what is right and forbidding what is wrong. According to the scholars, it is a compulsory act. That is to command what is right and to forbid what is wrong. However, it is that type of compulsion or that type of compulsory act which if some members of the Muslim community do it, then the responsibility is removed from the other members of the community. This is known as wajib kifai. It should also be known that it is not a condition for a person who is commanding or forbidding something to be perfect and to stay away from whatever he commands or sorry, to do whatever he commands or to stay away from whatever he forbids. He has two responsibilities. To command himself and to do it, to prevent or to forbid others from doing what is wrong and himself stay away from it. If he is falling short in one of these areas, he should not allow himself to fall short in the other. He has two responsibilities. For this reason, even if he's not doing it himself, he should still command others and enjoy what is right and forbid what is wrong. This is the opinion of some of the ulama. We also know that there are certain things where a person or an individual does not have to be a scholar to command what is right and to forbid what is wrong. For example, the ulama, when dealing with this, point out certain specific areas. For example, a person is known to not pray. He has given up salah. Or he has given up fasting in the month of Ramadan. Or he is committing adultery or fornication or drinking some type of alcoholic beverage. All of these things are clearly known in our deen, and each individual knows that this is something that should not be done. So he has the right, rather a responsibility if he sees his brother doing this, to advise him to stay away from it. These are those things what the ulama call a rajibat of zahiva. These obvious compulsory acts that everyone is aware of. So he's able to advise his brother under these circumstances. And you don't need any specific knowledge to do so. There are other areas that are more involved and require special study. Under those circumstances, an individual should ask one who has knowledge. And he should not venture into areas where he has no knowledge. As Shafi, when speaking about commanding what is right and forbidding what is wrong, he mentioned something that should be taken into consideration. He said, whoever warns his brother or reprimands him secretly, he has advised him and has honored him. And whoever warns him and reprimands him in the open has disgraced him and lowered him. This is something that Imam Shafi'i pointed out because very often it is understood that an individual doesn't take warning or reprimand in the open very easily. And so it is better to pull him aside and tell him that what he did is wrong, what she did was not correct. Here, <clears throat> the Prophet wasallam in this hadith deals with what should come first if a person has the ability to do so. Here he points out changing what is wrong with the hand. If a person has the ability to do so, and he sees something wrong, he should change it with his hand. If he's unable to do that for whatever reason, he should at least speak out against it. And if he's not able to do this because of fear that some something might happen or something greater might occur, then he goes and he hates it in his heart. He hates it in his heart. And this is something that we find that the scholars of Islam dealt with extensively, that commanding what is right should be right. Forbidding what is wrong should be done appropriately as well. If a person is afraid and he is more certain that if he were to change something with his hand it would cause more confusion and a greater fitness or greater types of corruption, he should stay away from changing it with his hand. 
but he should speak out against it. Likewise, he's afraid that speaking out against it at that particular time would cause, for example, bloodshed and a greater fitness than he is trying to change, and he should be quiet and hated in his heart, at least for that moment. Also, it is not recommended that a person who is commanding what is right and forbidding what is wrong to go and break down the doors of individuals simply because he thinks someone is doing something that is wrong. This is something which should not be done. This particular hadith <coughs> stresses one of the principles that is very well known amongst Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, the Salaf and the Salih, and that is a man are of different degrees. Some people have strong faith and others their faith is not so strong. And this is expressed in the statement of the Prophet Wasallam, where he said, وَذَلِكَ أَضْعَفُ man, And this is the weakest form of faith. From this we have a number of benefits then, that changing what is wrong and commanding what is right is a responsibility on the Ummah as a whole. If one individual does it, then if this is sufficient, then the sin is removed from the rest of the community. If he's able to change something with his hand, he should do so. If this was called, would cause greater confusion, then he should speak out against it. If speaking out against it would cause a greater confusion, or more fitness, trouble, and trials, then he should at least hate it in his heart. This is the least that a person can do. He should always, there is no excuse ever for enjoying in one's heart what is wrong. There is no excuse because not having hate in your heart for what is wrong shows the absence of faith. The Prophet also <clears throat> in emphasizing this point, he expressed in another hadith and for the benefit of our brothers and sisters who are listening. We have a narration on the authority of Hudayfa. And the Prophet وسلم, swore, and he said, By him in whose hand is my soul, you shall command what is right, and forbid what is wrong, or Allah shall come close to sending upon you a punishment, and you shall supplicate to him, and you shall not be answered. Hadith number 8 The authority of Abi Hurairah correlates that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said you shall not enter Jannah paradise until you believe and you will not believe until you love one another should I not direct you to a thing which if you were to do it you shall love one another spread the greetings of peace amongst you This hadith, as pointed out a few moments ago, was related by Abi Hurairah. Abi Hurairah is one of the very outstanding companions of the Prophet ﷺ. However, his name and the name of his father, the scholars differ among themselves concerning this. We have more than 30 different opinions concerning this. However, even Abdul Bar is of the opinion that what seems to be most correct is that he is Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhr. And this is agreed by some of the other scholars. He is probably one of the Sahabas who narrated most of the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. He lived <coughs> to be a ripe age of 78 and he was buried in Baqiya with the rest of the companions of the Prophet wasallam. And it was said that Walid ibn Uqtar ibn Abi Sufyan, who was the Amir of Medina, was the one to lead his prayer, his janazah. This hadith points out to a very important aspect of our deen. And that is, as long as an individual has the smallest amount of faith in Allah, he shall one day enter Jannah. But he has to have a man. And this is pointed out by the statement of the Prophet وسلم, where he said, You shall not enter Jannah until you believe. 
and tell you are a believer. That is a believer in Allah and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and all of the essentials of the man. This then is for the one who has the smallest amount of and this is we have seen in a number of other narratives where the Prophet ﷺ pointed out that whoever has this amount of Iman shall enter Jannah. This however does not mean that a person can do anything that he likes and he will go directly to the paradise. Nay, the Prophet ﷺ taught us elsewhere that there shall be people from Ahlul Tawheed, people who have the shahada, who shall enter the hellfire until they will be like charcoal, charred, and then mercy shall overcome them, and they shall be given to drink from the river of life. In some narrations, it said that water from the river of life shall be sprinkled on, sprinkled on them, and they shall bloom once again. Another narration points out to this truth where the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever says, La ilaha illallah, and jathu yawman min dahrihi, asabahu qabla dalika ma asabahu. Whoever says, La ilaha illallah, that there is no God who will be worshipped other than Allah, it shall save him one day, even though he might be afflicted before that by some grave punishment, meaning entering into the hellfire. So this particular hadith then, teaches us. One of the conditions for entering the Jannah is the heavy man, meaning that those who are kuffar shall not enter therein. The other benefit from this hadith, we learn that a person shall not have complete faith, not that he will not be a believer, meaning that he will be a kafir, but he will not have complete faith, and we as believers shall not develop this quality of complete faith until we love one another. Loving one another then is an expression of faith. The opposite is an expression of kufr. That is, to fight with one another. And this has been expressed by the Prophet ﷺ in another narration where he said, Do not return after me like the kufar, striking or smiting each other's neck. That is, fighting amongst yourselves. Love, then, is an expression of faith. It is the byproduct that comes in mutually believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also in believing and following the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam points out another benefit in this particular narration here. And he actually directs us as to how we can develop this love which will develop our Iman and which shall allow us to enter into Jannah. He said that you should spread the greetings of peace amongst you. That you should spread the greetings of peace amongst you. And that is when you meet your Muslim brother to greet him. Assalamu alaikum. And for the greeting to be returned, wa alaikum assalam. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ himself put this into practice and there are many narrations to support this. The Prophet Muhammad ﷺ not only encouraged the spreading of the greetings of peace but also taught us how it should be done. We have a narration from Abi Huraira where the Messenger of Allah ﷺ said that the person riding should greet the one who is walking. This means that he is to be the first to begin the greetings of peace. And the one walking should greet the one sitting. The smaller group should greet the larger group. In another narration by Al-Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ pointed out that the younger members of the community should greet those that are older. The Prophet ﷺ used to pass by the small children playing in the streets of Medina and he would greet them as reported by Anas. And the Prophet ﷺ also taught Anas, he said to him, 
Oh my young son, my young boy. When entering on your family members, greet them. It will be a blessing for you and for the household. These are some of the things that point out the teachings of the Prophet them in respect to the greetings and also how it is to be done. We have some narrations where the Prophet mentioned, he said, if any of you meets his brother, he should beat him. That happens to come between him, both of you, a tree or a wall or even a stone, and then you meet him again, then once again greet him. This is something that the Prophet ﷺ himself practiced. In a narration from Abi Huraira, a person came into the masjid, he prayed incorrectly. Then he came and he greeted the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ responded, returning his greeting. And he said to him, return and pray because you did not pray properly. The man repeated this. And he again returned and he greeted the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet Muhammad ﷺ responded by returning his greeting. This happened three times. Spreading the salams, the greetings of peace, is a pathway to Jannah. Hadith number 9 Abu Huraira reported that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, The fornicator who fornicates is not a believer so long as he is committing the act of fornication. And no thief who steals is a believer as long as he is committing theft. And no drunkard who drinks wine is a believer as long as he is drinking it. Abu Malik ibn Abi Bakr narrated this on the authority of Abu Bakr ibn Abdul Rahman ibn Harith. And then he said, Abu Huraira made this addition. No plunderer who plunders a valuable thing that attracts the attention of people is a believer so long as he commits this act. This narration has a number of benefits and it's probably one of the more important narratives with which you will deal. It deals with Iman, the whole concept of faith. And this hadith has been looked at by some to indicate that whoever commits a major sin is doomed to enter hell forever, eternally. And this is because the statement of the Prophet Wasallam seemed to imply that the person who commits these acts has no faith. And we have already seen that the person who has no faith is a kafir. And that the kafir shall not enter Jannah. He shall never enter Jannah. This understanding However, it is not correct for a number of reasons. The first reason, and we probably would just stop here, is because of what the Prophet ﷺ said in another narration, a narration reported to us on the authority of Abi Dhaf, who said that he sat near to the Prophet ﷺ who told him, that whoever declares that there is no God worthy of worship other than Allah and then dies on that with that faith, he shall enter Jannah. Abu Dhar went on and he said, even if he commits adultery or fornication and steals, he, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded, even if he committed adultery or fornication and stole. I said, even if he committed adultery or fornication and stole something, he, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, even if he committed the of fornication and stole, this was repeated three or four times. The fourth time, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in spite of Abidhar, Abidhar thereupon left repeating these words and saying, in spite of Abidhar. 
In this particular narration, the Prophet ﷺ pointed out that even if a person committed a major sin, like adultery, fornication, or stealing something, that he, if he had faith, that he shall one day enter Jannah. And this was said previously. It is left up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how he deals with him. If Allah so wills, he might forgive this person if he so wills. He might punish this person because of his wrongdoings. However, as we have seen previously, he shall not abide eternally in the fire like the kuffar shall do. This then is the way of the scholars who understand this deal of ours correctly. They bring about a relationship between the two narratives, showing the real understanding of our deen, and that a person who commits a major act, a major sin, that he is not doomed to the hellfire eternally. His case is left with Allah. He might be forgiven and allowed to enter Jannah without going to hell. Or he might be punished for that particular act. This is the way a relationship is brought about between this narration that we're dealing with and the narration of Abidur. The person then who commits those acts is not a person who has complete faith. And this is how the, un the, the hadith was understood by some of the other scholars. That the individual who committed this act, any of the, the above mentioned acts, those sinful deeds, he does not have complete faith. And this is what is meant by the statement of the Prophet wasallam that he does not steal while in the state of Iman. He doesn't have complete Iman. Other scholars look at it and say that the person cannot truly be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while doing that particular deed, that wrong, committing that act. You cannot have the type of strong Allah consciousness and awareness that an individual who would dare not venture upon that act. This hadith also, as pointed out by some of the ulama, actually is an indication of the different types of sins. The zina mentioned here actually indicates all types of desires. All types of desires that a person might adhere to and that might lead him away from the straight path and away from obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and away from the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As far as stealing is concerned, it also points to a desire to have worldly wealth in this dunya. So much so that a person would want to do haram. That type of desire, burning desire, is indicated in this act of stealing. The mention of alcoholic beverages, khamar, is an indication of all those things that prevents an in, that prevent an individual from obeying Allah and keeps him unmindful of his responsibility to his Lord. Plundering the wealth, taking the wealth of another, one of Allah's servants, shows little regard, almost as if a person fully belittles others in all aspects in an effort to acquire worldly wealth. These are some of the things that are indicated in this hadith, if not spelled out. We are therefore required to stay away from these areas. They diminish a person's faith. Kills the Allah consciousness that we are supposed to develop as believers. It kills the spirit that we are supposed to have as a brotherhood. And therefore, it is something that we definitely should struggle to stay away from. The benefits then, once again. A man, as long as a person has belief in his heart, even if he commits a major sin, 
This does not mean that he shall abide in the fire of hell forever. Major sins do not take a person out of Islam, necessarily. Also, we know that if a person commits a major sin, he is left up. It is left up to the will of Allah to either forgive him or to punish him, as was pointed out in the narration that we saw earlier, that a person shall be saved because of his belief, even though he might be punished before that in the fire of hell. There are others who thought that the person who committed a major sin shall abide in hell forever. The narration of Abidhar refutes that. It disproves it. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever has the shahada, even if he commits fornication or adultery, which is a major sin, or even if he steals, which is another major sin, that this person shall enter the paradise. That statement of the Prophet ﷺ then goes against what those people think. And it points out that their way of thinking is not correct. At the end of this narration, Abu Huraira made this addition. No plunderer who plunders a valuable thing that attracts the attention of people is a believer as long as he commits this act. The statement that Abu Huraira made this addition would lead one to think that this is not a statement of the Prophet ﷺ. However, we find in other narratives that it was the Prophet ﷺ himself who made this statement. And this is not uncommon in narrating a hadith from the Sahabas. Sometimes they might express something that they had learned from the Prophet ﷺ in this way without attributing it to him. This then is something of benefit in respect to the last part of this hadith. This is the end of tape one and we shall be moving on to the second tape.